from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want to speak on John's Gospel, the 11th chapter, the 25th verse. And Jesus is speaking to Martha. Lazarus has died, and Lazarus is in the tomb, and Jesus is trying to comfort Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus. And here's what he says. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And she saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe. I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. You know, the Bible talks about three parts of us. The Bible says that we are built with three things. First, we have a body. Now, your body allows you to see people, to walk, to hear, to shake a hand, but the body can never make a friend. It is the soul and the personality that has the capacity to love a person and to have social relationships. And most of us don't like to go to funerals. We don't like to talk about death. And we in America have a great fear of death. And the Bible says in Hebrews, the second chapter, who through the fear of death were all their lifetime in bondage. The fear of death can hold you in bondage all your life, says the Bible. In Genesis 3:19, the Bible says, For dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. And in Genesis 5, it mentions this. It says this, And he died 11 times. You're going to die. Are you prepared to die? The Scripture says, Prepare to die. Prepare to meet God. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. But Satan whispered to Adam and Eve and said, Thou shalt not surely die. And he still uses the lie on you. You say somebody else is going to be killed in that automobile crash. It's going to be somebody else that's going to get pneumonia and die. It's going to be somebody else that gets cancer. It's somebody else that's going to have a heart attack. But one of these days, it'll be you. We look at our screens and we see motion pictures like Gable and Lombard or pictures on Marilyn Monroe and we think that they're alive or we even see former President Kennedy come back on the screen or Martin Luther King come back on the screen and somehow we get it in our minds that, that they're alive right now just like that in the same old body but they're not, they're dead. So the body dies. Everybody's body is going to die. Your body will go to the grave. The second part of us is called the soul. Sometimes we interchange it, soul and spirit. But I believe there's a difference between the soul and the spirit. But the soul, what is the soul? The soul can think, the soul can decide, the soul can desire. The soul can know, it can love, it can hate, it can react. To sum it up, the soul is that part of us that we call personality. Now, I have two dogs at home, German Shepherds, highly trained dogs, I might add. One of them's trained to run when you come, and the other one's trained to growl or bite if necessary. But you know, I've noticed that those dogs, they have emotions, they grieve, they, wor they seem to worry, if they're not fed in time. And they get angry and they love and they each have their own personality. Because you see, a dog has a soul, just like you did. The whole animal world has a soul. If animal has body and personality similar to humans, then what makes humans different? Have you ever thought of that? What makes you different than your dog? What makes you superior to an elephant? What makes you superior to any other animal? The third thing, the body, the soul, the animals have bodies, the animals have souls, but no animal has a spirit. The spirit is something that only humans have. 
man possesses something in addition to his body and his soul that the animal does not have. He has the spirit. And the spirit is totally unique. The ability, you know what the spirit is? The spirit is the ability to know and to enjoy and to have fellowship with Almighty God. The God of the universe, the God that made the stars and the moon and the sun and the whole world. You, just little old you, can have fellowship with that mighty God because God gave you a spirit. You are a spirit. Your spirit lives in your body. You're born with that spirit, that ability to have fellowship with God. And the spirit makes even the lowest person in the whole world superior to the highest animal. Thus, the human race operates on three levels, physically with the body, socially with the soul, spiritually with the spirit. Now, the question is, what has happened to our spirits? The Bible says that our spirits are dead in sin and trespasses. We've rebelled against God, and our spirits have been cut off from God, and our spirits are dead. And the reason Jesus Christ came and died on the cross was to reconcile us to God. Sin has separated my spirit from God. I cannot fellowship with God. I cannot know God. I might study all my life theology and never find God. I might study philosophy all my life and never find God. I may be the most brilliant scientist in the world and never find God. Because something has come between my spirit and God and that something is sin. And the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You are a sinner. I am a sinner, separated from God. This is a planet in which all human beings are born separated from God. You can be physically alive, soulishly alive, but spiritually dead. The Bible says, she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she lives. There's a country western song this year that has an older cowboy singing to a younger one that's what needed is faster horses, younger women, older whiskey, and more money. And that's what the world is, alive but dead. Faster horses? Alive but dead. Very much like the man Jesus told about who was a rich man. And he said, soul, take thine ease, drink and be merry. You've got many years. Build bigger barns. And God called him a fool and God killed him that night. And God said, thou fool. Many of you think that you have Years and years and years and years. And you don't know that at this very moment there is appointed a day that you are to meet God. And it may be this week. We never know. In this passage that I read, Lazarus, a person that Jesus loved very much and one of his closest friends, had died. And I watched the other night on television a replay of that magnificent picture of George Stevens, the greatest story ever told. And I thought one of the most dramatic scenes in the whole motion picture is when Lazarus is raised from the dead. And I thought of Lazarus as he was in that tomb. He'd been there for several days. And there are several things about him as I looked and thought about it. Lazarus didn't have any appetite. When he was alive, he got hungry regularly, but while he's dead, he doesn't have any appetite. And did you know if you're spiritually dead, your spirit is dead? You don't have any appetite for God. You don't have any appetite to read the Scriptures and to have prayer and to talk about spiritual things. You're spiritually dead. You can go to church. Thousands of people today belong to the church that are spiritually dead. 
They don't really have any appetite for God, for fellowship with God. And the second thing about Lazarus I thought about was the, there was no activity. A spiritually dead person has no spiritual activity. They have much physical activity and social activity, but little activity on behalf of the kingdom of God. A few months ago, my wife and I went down to Guatemala with Luis Palau, who is here tonight. Right after the earthquake, and we saw devastation on a scale we have never seen anywhere in the world, and our hearts ached for those people. And I said, by the grace of God, we're going to do all we can for the hungry and the needy and the hurting people of the world, whether they're at home or whether they're abroad. Activity for the kingdom of God. And then another thing about Lazarus, there was no awareness. He was not aware of his friends. Dead men don't love. Dead men don't see danger. Dead men are, are unmoved by hunger. Dead men don't weep. And then the fourth thing, he was blind. And the Bible says that we too are blind. We have spiritual blindness. Your spirit can be blind. The Bible says the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. You are spiritually blind. And then the fifth thing about him was he smelled. He'd been dead for four days, and they said he already stinks. But you know what the Bible says? The Bible says all of our righteousness and our goodness that we try to pile up to please God smells in the sight of God. It's like filthy rags, the Scripture says in Isaiah 64, the sixth chapter. We're saved by grace through faith that not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then the sixth thing about Lazarus was he was bound. You know, the Oriental's method of embalming was one of the most effective the world has ever known. It consisted of endless wrappings. And yet you are alive tonight physically. You're alive as far as your social activity is concerned, but you are bound and spiritually dead. You're bound by habits and sin. Johnny Cash talked a moment ago about drugs and alcohol, and men are bound by the chain of habit, the lust and sin of drugs, the lust for money, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, sex sins. All of that indicates spiritual deadness. Soulishly, you're alive. Physically, you're alive. But your spirit is dead toward God. Would you like to be made alive tonight? Totally, completely fulfilled? Totally alive? Spiritually? What can you do? Well, let's think, what could we do for Lazarus? Now he's dead. Let's give him some food. They say, well, what we need to do is feed everybody. Jesus didn't feed everybody when he came. Do you know that? There are thousands of millions of hungry people in the world. We have compassion. We're to do what we can. But that does not bring about reconciliation with God. They have a deeper hunger, a deeper need to be met, and that's the need of reconciliation with God. You say, well, give people better housing. That's all good. We ought to give people better housing, and I'm for everything that can give better housing to people in this country and people all over the world. But that doesn't bring back the spirit. The spirit is dead. Man has a deeper need. Man's greatest need is reconciliation with God, and that's what Christ came to do on the cross. You say, well, maybe they need more entertainment. Change their environment. You know, many intellectuals today, I notice, are growing uh, disillusioned with the whole human race. They're disillusioned because they fail to understand that the problem of the human race is a spiritual problem. The problem of the human race is not a soulish problem. The problem of the human race is not a physical problem. The problem of the human race is a spiritual problem. Man's spirit is separated from God. He hates, he lies, he cheats, he fights, he kills, he has war because his spirit is not right with God. So man needs to get his spirit straightened out with God. 
There's one great thing that a dead man needs. You know what it is? He needs life. And Jesus himself claims to be the life that spiritually dead men need. He said that the reason he came into the world was that he might give life more abundantly. He said, here's one of the greatest passages in all of literature. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, if you were a dead person lying in a grave, wouldn't you like to hear that? I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. You believe in Jesus Christ. That means to commit to surrender your life to him, to receive him as your Lord and your Savior. And you can have spiritual life. In addition, the Bible says your body is someday going to be raised from the dead. You say, how can that be? I don't know how it can be. I only know that science says that no chemical is lost in the, in the world today. And the God that made it in the beginning can bring it together again. But your spirit will be joined to your body again in the future world if you know Jesus Christ. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never, never, never die. Your spirit can be made alive and have fellowship with the God of the universe by believing in Jesus Christ. Now, that is essentially and basically what the gospel is all about, and that's why it's called good news to the world. That's what the word gospel means, good news. And it's good news to millions and billions of people who are dead toward God to say that there is a person that can give you spiritual life and change you and make you a new person. You don't get eternal life when you die. You get eternal life the moment you receive Christ. You can have fellowship with God through Bible reading, through prayer, through fellowship with other Christians. You have fellowship with God. Your spirit is alive. Your body may get tired. Your body may get hungry. Your body may be in prison. Your body may be destroyed by the scars of sin that have already taken place. But God will forgive the sin that came between you and God. He will help you and restore you in a thousand ways, but you've got to be willing to go all the way. You know why some people really never find God? They're not willing to go all the way. They want to go part way, third of the way, half way three-quarters of the way, 90% of the way, 99% of the way. But Jesus won't accept you. He says it's all the way. That's the reason he said in that chapter we read last night, he said, I will not commit myself to you. You believe in me, but I don't believe in you. I know what's in your heart. I know what you're holding back. You've got to be willing to surrender all if you are to have eternal life. Then he turned and he asked Mary and Martha, he said, Believest thou this? And Martha answered and said, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God that should come into the world. And you know, Jesus did an interesting thing. He wept. And the shortest verse in the Bible is Jesus wept. Only three times did Jesus weep. He wept at the grave of Lazarus. He wept at Gethsemane the night before Calvary. And he wept over the city of Jerusalem when he saw that Jerusalem was rejecting him as the Savior. And he weeps tonight, I believe, over the great cities of America as he sees the great majority of the people ignoring him, going on in their spiritual deadness, like dancing on the Titanic before it hit the iceberg. And he weeps. There are millions tonight in the tomb of sin. There are thousands here tonight in the tomb of sin. You need to be awakened. Many of you are in the grip of an evil habit, too strong to break, worse than a living death. What was Jesus' answer? 
he went to the tomb and he said, Lazarus, come forth. Do you know why I believe Jesus wept? I don't believe Jesus wanted to call Lazarus back. Lazarus was already in heaven. I don't believe Lazarus wanted to come back. You get a person that has died and gone to heaven just for one minute and they see the glory of heaven. Why, you couldn't pay them enough money in all the world to get them to come back. You and I weep for them. They're not weeping, they're happy. Their spirits are happy in total fellowship with God and their friends and the reunion and the happiness that's taking place there. Jesus wept, I believe, because he didn't want to have to call Lazarus back. But in order for his credentials as the Messiah to be established, he was going to raise the dead. So he said, Lazarus, come forth. If he hadn't said the name Lazarus when he said, come forth, every person that had ever died in the history of the world would have come out of the grave. So he said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth. But Lazarus was still tied in the old clothes. Jesus said, loose him. Now you and I have to be loosed. After we come to Christ, we have to be loosed from our sins the things that bound us. We have to be set free. And there's many a person that says to me, Billy, I would like to come to Christ, but I don't think I could hold out. You're right. You can't hold out. But he'll hold you. And Johnny was telling us a moment ago about that verse in 1 Corinthians that he came across, and what a marvelous verse. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is is common to man. But God will not allow you to be tempted above that which you're able to bear, but will with the temptation make a way to escape. And even I forgot it, Johnny, because the, there's a phrase there that says God is faithful. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted. In other words, God makes a provision for your Christian life. He gives you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside and gives you supernatural power to live a supernatural life. And your spirit is made alive and you have fellowship with God. I'm asking you tonight, will you receive Christ? Are you willing to go all the way with him and commit everything to him? Your mind, your heart, your body, your friends, your family. And you would like to say tonight, I want my sins forgiven. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want eternal life. I want Jesus to come into my heart tonight. I'm going to ask you to do something that we cannot do tonight. Every night, this stadium has been almost filled, not quite like it is tonight. And we put people on the floor tonight. And when we put you on the floor, we knew that we could not call people forward as we normally do. So I'm going to ask all of you that want to receive Christ, I want you to stand up where you are. We're not going to ask you to come forward. Just stand up where you are and stand there quietly and prayerfully and with bowed heads. And I'm going to ask every head bowed and every eye closed and everybody in an attitude of prayer and tonight you want Christ in your heart. You want eternal life. Just stand up and keep standing all over the place. Hundreds of you. Just stand up right now. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. The love of God is greater power tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. 
could we with ink the ocean fill? Or were the skies of parchment made? Were every stock on earth a quill? And every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the from sky to sky Oh love of God how rich and pure how measureless and strong it shall forever more and Saints, the angels song. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to Job, the 14th chapter and the 14th verse. Job, the 14th chapter and the 14th verse. Now, Job is in the Old Testament, and uh, it's the oldest book in the world. There is no known book in the world as old as the book of Job. And yet, Job asks a question that I'm sure disturbs many of you tonight. He asks a question that every great philosopher has wrestled with. He asks a question that every great thinker and intellectual at some time wrestles with. He asks the same question that one of the greatest scientists in this country asked me about three weeks ago. He said, science knows nothing about it, but he said, I'm disturbed about it and worried about it. Here is the question. If a man die, shall he live again? If a man die, shall he live again? The problem of death and life, or life and death. Haven't you ever thought about that? You've been to a funeral? For a few moments, you're solemn, you're thoughtful. That night, you go back, you go to bed, you think about it. One of these days, they're going to be taking me out to the cemetery. They'll be saying some words over me. Is that the end? Is it all over? You know what the Bible says? The Bible says there's a time to be born and a time to die. Birth is a happy event. Death is a tragic event. And we have tears. You take the fifth chapter of Genesis and you'll see the list of all those men that lived to be old men. Adam lived 930 years, but he died. Methuselah lived 969 years, but he died. I read about a man the other day in Brazil that they claim lived 134 years, but he died. At the end of every life is death. Life is very brief. The Bible says it's a tale that is told. It's a weaver's shuttle. It's a flower that fades. It's like the grass that withers. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow expressed it once when he said, Art is long and time is fleeting. And our hearts, though stout and brave, still like muffled drums are beating, funeral marches to the grave. And that's exactly where we're all headed. It is appointed unto man once to die. Thou shalt die and not live. Now, the great question is, are you ready to meet God? Because the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, but after that, the judgment. There is something after death according to this book. Now, again, I say I can't take you to a scientific laboratory and prove it to you, 
But this book teaches from Genesis to Revelation that this life is only a preparation room for eternity. There is another life. The Old Testament teaches it. The New Testament teaches it. Jesus taught it. The apostles taught it. If a man dies, shall he live again? That's the question Job asked. That's the question that millions are asking tonight, and the answer from the Bible is a resounding yes. Yes. There is a life after death. If a man dies, shall he live again? Cicero, the great Roman, said, upon this subject I entertain no more than conjecture. I've spent a great deal of my life searching for the answer. Mrs. Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, in one of her columns a few years ago said, it's instinctive for man to believe in life after death, and it is. You never find a tribe anywhere in the world, you never find a culture, you never find a civilization anywhere in history that didn't believe in some form of life after death. And when the early forefathers and pilgrims came to this country, they thought they had found some tribes in New England that didn't believe, tribes of Indians that didn't believe in life after death, but they soon found when they communicated with them that they believed in the happy hunting ground. Yes, man instinctively, something down inside says there must be a future life. There must be something beyond this life. But after all, there's only one authoritative person that can speak on this subject. Because he came from the grave. He rose, and his name was Jesus Christ. About two or three years ago, I had the privilege of having an interview with, Con uh, with Chancellor Conrad Adenauer in his last year in office as Chancellor of Germany. He had invited me. I was preaching in Germany, and he had invited me to come and see him, and I didn't know what about. I was quite surprised and, of course, flattered to get the invitation. And I went. He greeted me. Big, tall, giant of a man, the man that had almost single-handedly brought democracy back to Germany after the war. And I wondered, what does this great man want of me? The first question he asked me was this. He said, do you believe in life after death? I said, yes, sir, I do. I said, I believe the Bible teaches it. He said, I do too. He said, I am studying the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he said, when I leave office as chancellor, I intend to spend the rest of my life studying the resurrection of Christ because he said, if Christ is alive, there is hope in the world. He said, if Christ is not alive, there is no hope that I can see that civilization can be saved. Wasn't that something? Yes, Jesus Christ is alive. He rose from the dead, and that day, that Easter Sunday morning, that first Easter, when Mary and Mary Magdalene and Salome went to the grave expecting to anoint a dead body, they saw the angel sitting there. And they said, where is Jesus? The angel said, he is not here, he is risen. I submit to you tonight that that's the greatest news the world has ever heard. He is not here. He has conquered the grave. He's alive. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe that there's more proof that Jesus Christ rose from the dead than almost any other fact in Roman history. I don't believe there's a fact in ancient history today so well proven as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But even if there was no proof, no historical proof, no scientific proof, and there is, I would still believe it because I believe this book is God's inspired word and the whole early church went up and down the country preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That was the thing that shook the Roman Empire, that a man had risen from the dead, that he was alive, that death could not hold him. Christ is alive. 
He's a living Savior. And yet many of his followers and Christians live and act as though he's dead. He's not dead. He's alive. And the Bible says that at a given moment, a given signal, he's coming back to this earth to set up his kingdom. And what a kingdom it's going to be. It'll be a world in which there will be no tears and no sorrow and no death. There'll be no suffering. There'll be no war. There'll be no police forces. There'll be no armies. It's going to be a glorious world ruled by one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's alive. I've given my life not to a dead Christ, but to a living Christ. And I'm following a living Savior. And he's given me a song to sing. He's given me a flag to follow. He's given me something to believe. I have reason for existence. I know where I've come from. I know why I'm here. I know where I'm going. Do you? God said, Hezekiah, get your house in order. You're going to die. Now, you and I are going to die because, you see, the Bible teaches that you and I have a body. But living inside of our body is the real you. You're a real person. And that's the part of you that lives forever. Your body is going to go to the grave. But you, the real you, your intelligence, your memory, your personality is going to live forever and ever. According to the Bible, you will never die. And you're going to spend a million years, a billion years, in one of two places, according to Jesus. Not according to Billy Graham, but according to Jesus. Jesus talked a great deal about heaven, but he talked three times more about hell than he did heaven. The other writers of the Bible don't have too much to say about hell, but Jesus talked about it all the time. In the Sermon on the Mount, I've had fellows say, I don't believe in hell. I live by the Sermon on the Mount. Well, you've never read the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus talked about it. Now, what did he mean by it? He said, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire, and there shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. What did he mean? Matthew 25, 41, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. What did he mean? He is saying that hell was never made for man. He is saying that God will never send anybody to hell. If man goes to hell, he goes by his own free choice. Hell was created for the devil and his angel, not for man. God never meant that a man should go there. And God has done everything within his power to keep you out. He even gave his son to die on that cross to keep you out. Because you see, when God made you, he made you a free moral agent. You can live any kind of life you want to. You can live a good life, you can live a bad life. You can break God's laws, you can obey them. You can shake your fist in God's face and there's nothing God can do because when he created you, he gave you a gift of free choice. You're not a robot that he push a, you push a button and you jump and obey. You've got a right to resist God, to reject God. But the Bible says, in spite of our rebellion and rejection, God loves you. He loves you so much that he gave his son to die for your sins. And when Christ died on that cross, we don't understand all that happened on that cross. But we know one thing, that he took the hell and the judgment that you deserved and I deserved because of our sins. He took it on that cross. And that's why that terrible expression comes from his lips, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because you see, the very meaning of hell is separation from God. And in that terrible moment 
a shadow passed between God the Father and God the Son for the first time since eternity began. Christ dying for you, and he suffered the pangs of hell. He became guilty of lying. He became guilty of slander. He became guilty of jealousy. He became guilty of the most filthy, dirty sins. And when those sins came into his soul, your sins and my sins came into his soul, God could not look because God cannot look upon iniquity. God is so holy. Christ took the hell that you and I deserved on that cross. Now God says, receive him, believe in him, put your trust and your confidence in him, and I will forgive your sins, and I will guarantee you eternity in a place called heaven. It's all yours, and it's all free. All you have to do is receive it. What an offer. He offers you tonight eternal life. Now, eternal life doesn't begin the moment you die. Now, when you die as a Christian, eternal life doesn't begin there. Eternal life begins the moment you receive Christ. Now, many of you here in South Carolina and in North Carolina and all over the country have been reared in Christian homes. Or you go to a church. You live a fairly decent life. And you're sort of living on the reflected afterglow of your parents' religion. But you've never really received Christ for yourself. You've never really trusted him for yourself. You don't know him really. You're not really sure that you're ready to meet God. And the Bible says, prepare to meet thy God. Are you prepared? Are you sure you're prepared? You know, the Bible says, these things I write unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. I can stand here tonight without being egotistical, without being conceited. I can stand here tonight and say to you on the authority of this book, I know my sins are forgiven. I know I'm going to heaven. I know that I'm going to live as long as God lives because the moment I received Christ, I became a partaker of God's own life. Now I'm going to live a billion years and I'll only have begun. I know that, not because of any goodness of my own. I'm not going to heaven because I've lived a good life. I'm not going to heaven because I've preached to great crowds of people. I'm going to heaven because of what Christ did on that cross. For by grace are ye saved, through faith, that not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. We're not going to heaven because we're good. We're not going to heaven because we work. We're not going to heaven because we pay. We're going to heaven because of what he did on the cross, and all I have to do is receive it. And it's so simple to receive Christ that millions stumble over its very simplicity. You see, God made it so simple that children can believe. He made it so simple and so easy that a blind man, a deaf man, a dumb man can believe. A man of any race can believe. A man of any nationality, of any language can believe. And that's all God says you have to do to get to heaven. Just believe. Now, that word believe is a little more than maybe you think it is. It means commitment. It means surrender. It means that I give everything I have to Jesus Christ and trust him alone for my forgiveness and my salvation. It means that the moment you receive him, your name is written in the book of life. Is your name in the book of life? Are you sure you're going to heaven? Are you prepared to meet God? If there's the slightest doubt in your heart tonight that you're prepared to meet God, don't you dare leave here without settling it. Why? Because you may never have another hour or another moment like this. You can't come to Christ any time you want to. The Bible says, He that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, that without remedy. Thousands of people have prayed for this crusade. The Spirit of God has brought you here. Hundreds of people have come to Christ already in this crusade. The way is prepared. Your heart is prepared. The Spirit of God is speaking tonight. This is the hour, this is the moment, and you may never have this moment quite like this again. I'm going to ask you to commit your life to Christ. 
to make sure that your name is written in the book of life, to make sure that you're going to heaven, and to receive tonight eternal life. And here's the way we're going to do it. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat right now, hundreds of you, get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this platform right now, quietly and reverently. I'm going to ask that nobody leave the service, please. Get up out of your seat, men, women, young people. You may be members of the church. You may be an usher. You may be a choir member. Get up out of your seat and come and stand here. And after you've stood here, I'm going to say a word to you. Have a prayer. Give you some literature. You can go back and join your friends. That's all there is to it. But it's very important that you come and make this public declaration. Jesus said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. You get up and come right now. There's something about coming forward that settles it and seals it in your heart. You get up and...